Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a fascinating series on the Great Controversy. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you know that that's a major deal in our church. This is lesson number four for April 27 of 2024, entitled, Standing for the Truth. Hmm, when did that happen in history? Mm -hmm. Well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we gather once again to consider your word and all of its implications, help us to know how we should come down on the side of truth and every, every time we have an opportunity. Help us to stand for the truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian church has been persecuted almost nonstop since the time when Jesus was crucified. Who do you suppose has been behind that? Yeah, Let's right. see if we could guess. <laughs> okay, the introduction, the introduction to the teacher's Bible study guide gives this important information. Jim? Of the Bible study guide, the early medieval f f faithful Christians were characterized not by their not only not only by their individual faithfulness to God and to His Word, but also by the public stand they took to proclaiming the principles of God's kingdom and self and of salvation. This era of reform compromises. No comprises. That's comprises. That's right. Comprises no ordinary period of persecution, though. Rather, it constitutes a pro prophetic period of 1260 years, spanning from A.D. 538 to A.D. 1798, as in this case of the other prophetic periods of persecution. This era also points to the fact that at the time of persecution, it limited is limited and that God is ultimately in control. Jennifer, let me interrupt for a second. Uh, we've talked about this before. How does God limit Satan's activity? Okay, well, let's move on. Go ahead. No, no. Jim, I've seen you can, I've just... The weapons of their offenses, excuse me, the weapons of their offensive were not derived from their own strength, vision, and wisdom, but they did but, nor, did the, nor did these defenders of the faith mount an assault against the forces of evil with cunningly devised military strategies. Rather, the mission of the true Christians and the secret of their power consisted in their discovery of love for and proclamation of the Word of God, no matter the cost. Yeah. The work of the Reformers resulted in a double achievement for both humanity and God. Their first achievement was understanding that the love of God is revealed in His Word, transforms the lives of His people, and gives them hope in the kingdom of God. Their second achievement was the proclamation of the Bible through Bible truth to the world in to the world in vindication of God's identity and character, both of the of which were designated by the forces of denigrated. evil, which were denigrated, you're correct, by the forces of evil in the great cosmic war from the Bible study guide. Okay, wow. Here is more background information for this lesson regarding persecution. So we're now moving into the time in the first couple, two or three hundred years after um, the time of, 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 Christ, of Jesus and the disciples, and persecution was really heating up. Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, the modern Turkish seacoast city of Izmir was once the biblical city of Smyrna, mentioned in the book of Revelation. This ancient city of approximately 100,000 inhabitants flourished in the late 1st and 2nd centuries. It was a prosperous city and it was fiercely loyal to Rome. Let me interrupt for just a second. I've had the privilege of visiting Izmir a couple of times. It's a very Muslim city today. There is one Christian church 
that's allowed to exist. And you have to have permission and get, you have to have someone with a key come and open the church for you to even go inside and look at it. Hmm. That's the status of Christianity in Izmir today. Okay, go ahead and read. And that is not atypical of, of all Islam. <laughs> and Islam does not understand, does not have a God that, of love, period. Well, we were lucky when I was there because a, a group from another country, completely Christians from another country, had made arrangements far in advance to, to have someone come and open it up, church, and, and so they could go in and, and have a small worship service. And we just happened to be there at the right time, so we joined in. I've gotten along fine with Muslim people. Oh, yeah. But they just don't, un just don't have that facet of their, uh, yeah. uh, of their, un of their understanding. And, and when, you, when a religion is uh, peddled based upon the fear and you either uh, change or, or pay a tax or, or, or be killed, yeah. uh, freedom is not there. It isn't part of the equation. Okay, Jennifer. Once a year, all the citizens of Smyrna were commanded to burn incense to the Roman gods. Evidently, in the second century, Smyrna, Smyrna had a thriving Christian community as well, and many were not going to comply. Uh oh. <laughs> Sounds like okay. Mervin Ma a Mervin Maxwell wrote "God Cares" Volume One and Two on, on Daniel Revelation. It said, in that volume, Gordon? the city of Smyrna was located north of Ephesus on a beautiful inlet of the Aegean Sea. It is a beautiful place. Under the name of Izmir, Smyrna still survives, the third largest city of Turkey and the most flourishing of the seven cities named in Revelation 2 and 3. <clears throat> Within about 70 years after this prophecy was made, Smyrna became the site of the notable series of martyrdoms spread over a period of several literal days. The 12th and last of the martyrs was grand old Polycarp, who by the time he died had served as principal minister of the Smyrna church for at least 40 years. It's amazing he could have survived that long. <laughs> at a very advanced age, Polycarp was arrested in a farmhouse one Friday night. Immediately he asked the farmer's wife to prepare supper for the soldiers who had come to arrest him. While the soldiers ate, Polycarp stood to one side in the small cottage and prayed aloud for two hours for every Christian he could think of in the Roman Empire. It's amazing. At the Smyrna Amphitheater next day, Governor Status Quadratus, Quadratus Quadratus, uh, was deeply Im impressed with Polycarp and tried to save his life. When his efforts proved futile, the governor asked Polycarp to curse Christ. He was certain that so grand a man as Polycarp would be eager to separate himself from Jesus, whom Rome had condemned as a criminal. But Polycarp gave a ringing response. And he said, Eighty and six years have I served him, and never has he done me wrong. How then can I curse my king who saved me? <clears throat> The crowd, including in this instance members of the Jewish synagogue, screamed for Polycarp to be fed to a lion. But the lions had just gorged themselves on other non-Christian victims. Wonderful kind of a society, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. A herald explained that anyway, it was past the hour for the day's entertainment when using lions was still legal. In other words, it would be <laughs> illegal to, <laughs> to, to use lions lion. for this like form. It's just... Mm at that time of day. Yeah. So the crowd demanded that Polycarp be burned to death. So. Mm. When the governor consented, the Jews, in a most unusual gesture of hostility, were foremost in gathering firewood, even though it was Sabbath. Oh. Amazing. <clears throat> and in a footnote, various Christian writers in the second and third centuries asserted that the Jews were often active in promoting persecution. However, the martyrdom of Polycarp is the only trustworthy and contemporary account of an actual martyrdom that reports actual participation by Jews. And that's from ancient yeah. documents, but, but translated by other people. And all that's from Mervyn Maxwell's God Cares, Volume yeah. 2. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself what motivated people like Polycarp Wycliffe, 
Haas, Jerome, and Martin Luther that we're going to be talking about in this series. Or Servetus. Yeah. The Bible makes it quite clear that those who are faithful to God will be persecuted. However, they will be triumphant in the end. And, of course, Daniel 7, we can look at that real quickly. This is the explanation I was given. Remember in this, this he's given a, Daniel is given a vision, and now he's given an explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then, then another king will appear. He will be very different from the earlier ones and will overthrow three kings. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. So that's the part that we're concerned about. We know based on the 1260 day prophecies found in both Daniel and Revelation that a time of terrible persecution and darkness would dominate the world. And we'll have a, in a moment, we'll go through the details about how we get to 1260 days. But um, go ahead, Myra. Yeah. From the Bible study guide, it says, whenever God's people remain faithful to him, Satan is enraged, persecution persecution often follows. The prophet Daniel described a time still future to him when the medieval church would make war against and per persecute God's people, Daniel 7, 21 and 25. The prophet John described this same period as a time when God's church would be forced to flee into the wilderness, where she would be nourished for a time and times and half a time, Revelation 12, 14. Revelation 12, 6 adds, the woman, or the church, fled into the wilderness where she, was at, where she has a place prepared by God. God's people were nourished in the wilderness. Let it's me interrupt for just a second. Do you know what, what context this prophecy was fulfilled? How did the church flee into the wilderness? There are two major things that happened that allowed the church to escape the throes of the Roman Catholic situation. Do you remember? There were the Walden Seas, which we'll talk about in the future. They escaped into the mountains on the border between Italy and France. But uh, a little bit later in time, the other way in which Protestants escaped the throes of the Catholic Church was the discovery of the United States of America. America. Yeah. Discovery of America. And many of them, the pilgrims who came to this country came because of religious persecution. Their pastor had already been killed because, of, because he, they didn't worship the way the official people said they were supposed to. Mm. So these are ways in which that prophecy was fulfilled. Okay. I, I've lost where I was. God's people were nourished in the wilderness. God's people were nourished in wilderness. His word strengthened yes, and sustained his them. His strengthened and sustained them as the great controversy raged on during this long and dark period of papal domination. From Bible Study Guide for Sunday, April 21. Okay, look at these verses which preceded the ones we read a moment ago. Daniel 7, 21 and 22. While I was looking, that horn made war on God's people and conquered them. So does this sound like God's people are doing well? No. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't sound good, does it? Then the one who had been living forever, now that would be God, it would have to be God, wouldn't it? Came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God. Now that sounds like a good thing. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. Well, we're not told exactly yet how that royal power is going to have to going to help us in dealing with this horn guy character. There are many places in the Bible, like Psalms 46, that promise protection for God's people. And we've looked at those last quarter. We talked about a lot about that, and then we're studying the book of Psalms. But we all know that, that there are lots of passages in Scripture that says if if you're faithful to me, you will, you will be protected. 
Our interpretation of many Bible prophecies depends on our understanding of the day-year principle. This principle is supported very specifically by Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. Let's just look at Numbers 14.34 here real quickly. You will suffer the consequences of your sin for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you spent exploring the land. So the, those group of spies were sent into the land, into the land of, of Judah, well, in the land of Palestine, Canaan in those days, they spent 40 days researching, looking around, getting, evaluating the situation, came back and gave that mixed report, as you remember. And now God says, okay, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness 40 years, one day, I mean one year for one day, to compensate to, to, in response to that. You will know what it means to have me against you. Okay. The day-year principle rests not on these two texts only, but on a broad scriptural foundation. William Shea, a chronologist and Old Testament scholar, gives 23 lines of biblical evidence throughout the Old Testament for this principle. Bible interpreters have used it throughout the centuries. Um, and the bottom line to that, if you just say it in a few words is Bible prophecies just don't work unless you use that principle. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, everything fits well if you, if you use that principle. Turning to history near the end of the pagan Roman Empire, Jim? The Visigoths, Vandals, and Ostrogoths were tribes that believed doctrines differently from the Rome, from different than Rome's official teaching. See below. The 1260 days began when the last of, the of these barbarian tribes, the Ostrogoths, were driven out of Rome in A.D. 538. This period of spiritual darkness con continued until A.D. 1798 when Napoleon's general, Berthier, removed the Pope from Rome. Let me interrupt for just a second. What happened in 538 is quite remarkable. Um, these Visigoths were, came from far up in the north. They weren't accustomed to some of the um, diseases which were common in the southern parts of Italy, for example, in those days. They came down to conquer Rome and they were sieging Rome and when they it didn't, I mean, they were waiting and they were waiting and, well, forget that. They realized that Rome was getting almost all of its water supply through viaducts that came from the mountains down into the city. So they said, well, we know what to do about that. We, they went up and crushed, broke, them up, broke those viaducts. What they didn't think about was where's the water gonna go? And the, the, the valleys and the whatever, the plains around that area got flooded with water and there was a huge infestation of mosquitoes and plenty of malaria. And the, the, these northern tribes, the men were so sick that the, the Pope was able to take a small force of people from Rome, came out there, and they conquered a, a, an army that was 20 times their size because all the, all the guys were, were sick unto death with malaria. And, and the locals, the folks from Rome, had some immunity. Yeah, exactly. Relative immunity. So that's how, how we arrived at the 538 date. Okay. Mm. Countless Christians were martyred during the long period because they obeyed the word of God. Even in death, they triumphed. In Christ, they were free from the guilt and the dominion of sin, overcoming through the blood of the Lamb. Christ's victory over Satan on the cross was their victory. And though they died, their death is, is only a rest until the return of Christ. And the, the Christian history is amazing because Again and again and again, people win through dying. <laughs> that, that, that just should be wrong, right? You, you're not supposed to win by dying. Well, without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission. Okay, that's another story. Which let us. But they, they died. Yeah. So they 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 got their death the, the all taken care of. Let us look at more history regarding the, how life works. The tribes that invaded Rome. Okay, Jennifer, I think that's yours. The, this is from Wolfram. 
the Visigoths, Austria. He was, by the way, an ancient historian mm. talking about Germanic tribes. Go ahead. The Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals were Christianized while they were still outside the bounds of the Roman Empire. However, they converted to Arianism rather than to the Nicene version, which is Trinitarianism, followed by most Romans who considered them heretics. This is oh. from Herwig Wolfram, 19. There's a big long thing there. Another term we need to understand is Arianism. Gordon? Arianism is Christian heresy that declared that Christ is not truly divine, but a created being. And there are a number of uh, religions that follow that. Right. According to the Alexandrian presbyter Arius in the fourth century, God alone is immutable and self-existent. And the Son is not God, but a creature with a beginning. So let's talk about that for just a second. They had some in, in councils that went on for years in the early Christian church over the first several hundred years, struggling with this question. How could a person be fully God and fully man at the same time? It just seemed impossible. And so one group would take the man side, well, he's fully human, but he can't be fully God. And the other, other side would take, well, he's fully God, but he can't then be fully human. And they, they argued, and they argued, and they argued. It went on for hundreds of years. And so that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. How has the Bible prophecy that has been, how has Bible prophecy that has been fulfilled strengthened your faith? Well, notice that John, uh, I'm sorry, Jude, prophesied that people will arise within the church who reject Jesus Christ as our only Master and Lord. That is a very apt description of the, Val, uh, the Vandals, Ostrogoths, and the Visigoths. So look at this prophecy that happened in the times of Jesus, well, almost in the times of the early disciples, as a prophecy of what we just talked about. From Jude, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I felt the need of writing at once to encourage you to fight on for the faith which once and for all God has given His people. For some godless people have slipped in unnoticed among us, persons who distort the message, compromise, the message about the grace of our God in order to excuse their immoral ways, and who reject Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Good News Bible. It must have been a very meaningful passage for those who tried to remain faithful Christians in the Middle Ages. And so let's be clear as we move along in this story about the history of Christianity, we're going to get deeper and deeper into these problems as, as we move along. Our Bible study guide says this admonition meant even more to believers in the Middle Ages after pagan practices had flooded into the church and human traditions compromised the Word of God. For many centuries, people such as the Waldenses, we'll talk more about them later, stood as champions for the truths of Scripture. They believed that Christ was their only mediator in the Bible, their, own, their sole source of authority from our Bible study guide. Ellen White commented, Jim, I think that's yours. In every age, there were, there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and men, who held the Bible as their only true, as the only rule of life, and hallowed the true Sabbath. Oh, why the Great Controversy, page yeah. sixty-one. Well, that's a pa parallel to uh, Hebrews one one to three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Many in way, various ways, God mm -hmm. spoken to the people in the past, but now He's speaking through, through His Son. Well, we, we've already talked a little bit about Smyrna and its prophecy and so forth. Revelation 2, 8 through 11 talks about that prophecy of Smyrna. This message to the Church of Smyrna was a very stark warning. Jennifer? The Bible Study Guide. These words were written to the Church of Smyrna. One of the city's patron gods was Dionysus. Is that how you say it? Dionysius. Oh, Dionysius, the god of festivity and fertility. When the priests of Dionys 
Dionysius died, a crown was placed on their heads in their funeral procession. John contrasts this earthly crown placed on the head of at death with the crown of life placed on the heads of those who are victorious over the forces of evil. The crown of life is presented to those who endure trials, difficulties, suffering, and death itself for Christ's sake. Wow. The crown of life inspires these faithful believers to endure death itself for Christ's sake. The crown of life always motivates believers in challenging circumstances. It inspired the Waldenses through pain and persecution. They knew they would see Jesus one day and live with him forever. The crown of life also speaks to us. We may go through trials now, but a crown of life awaits us as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And the adult well, Bible study guide. And those kinds, those ideas were, were prevalent even in, in Bible times. Um, I don't know if we have time to look at a couple of these passages. Let's look just specifically at Revelation 3, 11. If you get the handout, you'll see these other passages. I'm coming soon. Keep safe what you have so that no one will rob you of your victory prize. And that's what God is challenging us to. Um, these passages make it clear that God's faithful people will have to stand firm under very difficult circumstances. One group of Christians who stood out during the years of the Dark Ages were called the Walden Seas. From the Bible study guide, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Waldenses and each one of the reformers was their absolute allegiance to God, their obedience to the authority of scripture and their commitment to the supremacy of Christ, not the papacy. Their minds was saturated with, the New, with New Testament stories of faith and courage from the Bible study guide. Myra? From the Bible study guide, the Waldenses were one of the first groups to obtain the Bible in their own language. A moving account of their hand copying the Bible written by Jean Ledger, mm -hmm. a Waldensian Bible copyist, contains first-hand information of their work, including drawings. The Waldenses were secretly, the Waldenses secretly copied the scriptures in their mountain communities in northern Italy and southern France. Youth at the early age were instructed by their parents to memorize large portions of scripture. Teams of Bible copyists worked together to lab laboriously copy the Bible. Many of these Waldenses young adults traveled throughout Europe as merchants quietly sharing the truths of Scripture. Let me interrupt for just a second to try to understand the implications of this. This was way before printing was invented. So when they talked about making copies of the Bible, they're talking about writing it out by hand. And then these youths went all over hiding it in the in, in their ja jackets and mm -hmm. exactly sharing it to the right people. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. Sorry. <laughs> um, where was I? Um, teams of copyists. Um, teams of Bible copyists work together to laboriously copy the Bible. Many of these Waldensy young adults travel throughout Europe as merchants, quietly sharing their truths of Scripture. Some enrolled in universities and as the opportunity arose, shared portions of the scriptures with their fellow students. Guided by the Holy Spirit at the right moment, when they sensed a receptivity on the part of some honest seeker, select portions of their precious scripture pas passages were given away. Many paid for their fidelity and devotion with their lives. Although the Waldenses did not understand every Bible teaching clearly, they preserved the truth of God's Word for centuries by sharing it with others. And there's some amazing stories oh. uh, about the Walden Seas. If you want to read some just absolutely awe-inspiring stories, get yourself a book about the Walden Seas and what happened to them. Some of the young men and young, probably some women too, uh, would travel and they would pass out these, and it would seem like, okay, the authorities are just about to grab them and they're gone. 
And you know that that didn't happen just by accident. There was, there was a guiding hand involved in all of that. While we recognize that these early reformers were not, did not reject all the errors in the dominant Christian church, bit by bit, they focused light on the errors that had uh, crept into the church. And again, a number of verses that talk about standing faithful to the truth and so forth, but if we take time to read those, we won't get through with our lesson. As far back as the days of David, it was very clear that the Word of God, the inspired record of Scripture, is the cornerstone of our faith. The Bible was the cornerstone of the Reformation. Each of the Reformers, this is from our Bible study guide, each of the Reformers rejoiced in God's Word. They delighted in doing God's will. They loved His law. One of the most uh, significant foundational truths of the Reformation was the joy that studying the Scriptures brought, brought. Bible study was not a laborious task. It was not a legalistic, legalistic exercise. It was not a rigid requirement, but a delight. As they studied the Scriptures, they were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit from our Bible study guide. And, and try to think about this. So you have portions of Scripture hidden in your garments. You wear a long coat and there's stuff like this. And so you're, you're talking to some people and you're saying, hmm, I wonder if this person would be interested in something more. And you pull out a piece of Bible for them to read or you talk about the Bible and you hand it to them and you recognize that if you hand it to the wrong person, you're dead. Mm -hmm. mm. Think about the implications of that. John Wycliffe, who came along in the late 1300s, was known as the morning star of the Reformation. So we're starting again to getting into some of these other characters. So who is that? The, yeah. Jim? Yeah. The, character of Wil the character of Wycliffe is the testimony of and to the educating, transforming power of the Holy Scriptures. It was the Bible that made him what he was. The effort to grasp the great truths of the Revelation imparts freshness and vigor to all the faculty, in all, excuse me, to all, to all its faculties. It explains the mind, sharpens the perceptions, and ripens the judgment. The study of the Bible has enabled, has ennobled, Will every, ennoble. This includes you. Will ennoble. Every thought, feeling, aspiration, as no other study can. It has. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It de refines the character and sanctifies the soul. An earnest, reverence, reverent study of the scriptures brings the mind of the student in direct contact with the infinite mind would give to the world men of courage a stronger excuse me would give men of stronger and more active intelligent intellect. intellect as well as of nobler principle than has ever resulted from the ablest training that has that human philosophy affords wow Ellen white great controversy page 90 i wonder if that's ever been put to the test Anybody done a research project on that? Not likely, but it's... Uh, it, it, I'm sure it's probably... The, the Bible, and, and, and the, the, even the words of Ellen White are a, a, a great blessing Amazing. to... Uh, to uh, what counsel did the Apostle Paul give to Timothy regarding sharing the Word of God? Let me just read that. I think we have uh, time. We only... Basically, in a great controversy, you have Ellen White, but the Paul... Uh -huh. uh, the, the, the two biggest proponents of it. it, it, it yeah, of course, Jesus alludes to these things, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, Paul and Je uh, Ellen White are yeah. the, the, the pro biggest proponents we have. Paul said, As for you, my son, be strong through the grace that is ours in union with Christ Jesus. Take the teachings that you heard me proclaim in the pr presence of many witnesses and entrust them to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. So Paul is saying, spread the good word to people who will do what? Teach others. Teach others. Okay. Um, from the Bible study guide. 
The truth of God's word and the joy of salvation in Christ so filled the hearts of the reformers that they had to share it. John Wycliffe spent his life translating the word of God into English for two reasons alone. The living Christ changed him through the word and the love of Christ motivated him to share what he had learned with others. Before Wycliffe, very little of the Bible existed in English. Though he died before Rome got to him, the papacy, undeterred, dug up his remains, burned them, and threw his ashes into a river. But just as those ashes were dispersed <laughs> by the water, so God's word, the water of life, spread far and wide as a result of his work. Thus God used Wycliffe, quote, the, quote, morning star of the Reformation. Okay, so let me just ask you a question. For those who have been around academic circles and educational places for a long period of time, if someone produces a document and they start saying, you're not supposed, nobody's supposed to read this, guess what happens? <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody, wants. everybody wants to read it. And that's what happened with Wycliffe. And Wycliffe was such a scholar in the university and so forth like this. And he was chosen as the king's special pastor for a while and so forth like this. So he went from one situation to another and just sort of staying like one hand, one arm's length away from all of his enemies. And finally he died of disease. We are studying the great controversy. This is an all out life and death struggle between Christ and Satan. And we're, we're told even in the Bible, it says that. Gordon? Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, since the children, as he calls them, <clears throat> are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death, he might destroy the devil who has the power over death. And in this way, set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their faith, because of their fear of death from the Good News Bible. Myra? What was it that cheered the faithful Waldenses during the horrible persecutions they faced? What gave Huss and Jerome, Tyndale, Latimer, and the other martyrs of the Middle Ages courage to face the flames and the sword? Faith in the promises of God. They believed Christ's promise. Because I live, you will live, John 14, 19. They found his strength sufficient for life's greatest trials. They found joy through fellowship with Christ in his, in his sufferings, and their faithfulness was a power, powerful witness to the world. Bible study guide. And John 14, 19 says, In a little while the world will see me no more, Jesus speaking, mm -hmm. but you will see me, and because I live, you also will live future, right? Yes. And there's a bunch of other verses that say mostly the same thing, John 5, 24, John 11, 1 John 5, were words that cheered the hearts of those suffering through the dark ages. Jesus had promised that those who stay faithful to him already have eternal life. Huss and Jerome, another couple of very prominent reformers living in Bohemia and Prague, that would be what we now call the Czech Republic, uh, which is near the capital of the Czech Republic, which is now the capital of the Czech Republic, were scholars who recognized in, as they studied that the church predominant in their day had many errors. As they began to preach against these errors, they, reached, they received word from England about the work of John Wycliffe and the light spread. John Huss would not falter, and this is from our Bible study guide, John Huss would not falter in the face of imprisonment, injustice, and death itself. He languished in prison for months. The cold, damp conditions brought on a fever that nearly ended his life. And then Ellen White comments, the grace of God sustained him during the weeks of suffering that passed before his final sentence. Heaven's peace filled the soul. I write this letter, he said to a friend in my prison and with my fettered hand, expecting my sentence of death tomorrow. Imagine writing like that. When with the assistance of Jesus Christ, we shall again meet, 
in the uh, delicious peace of the future life, you will learn how merciful God has shown himself toward me, how affectionately he has supported me in the midst of my temptations and trials. And that's from my ancient writer, Bonachus, volume two. In the gloom of his dungeon, he foresaw the triumph of the true faith, as reported by Ellen White, the Great Controversy 107, 108. Is it really possible for Christians, even in our day, to believe that we could die for the truth and still live, still have an everlasting life before us? Yeah. Jim? God. God permitted great light to shine upon the mind. Read Mark 8 for us first. I'm sorry. Okay, Mark 8, 36. Do people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. This is from the Good News Bible. These are the words of Jesus, of course. <laughs> God permitted great light to shine upon the minds of these chosen men, revealing to them many of the errors of Rome, but they did not receive the light, all the light that was given to the world. They were not prepared to receive all the light at once, like the, excuse me, like the full glory of the noontide sun to those who have long dwelt in darkness, it would, if presented, have caused them to turn away. Therefore, he revealed to the leaders little by little as they could be, excuse me, as it could be received by the people. From century to century, other faithful workers were to follow, to lead the people to on, st on still further to the path of reform. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 103. And you've probably all had the experience sometime of being woken up out of sleep in a, with a bright light and you, <laughs> you know, you, you close your eyes and you're trying to, so you, you, you get the picture of what she's talking about there. So but it, it isn't necessarily uh, uh, parceling the, the message out to them. It's the matter of perception. Yeah. It's, a, it's a progressive recept, perception on the part of the receivers. Yeah. Uh, because the hard thing is to unlearn the garbage you've been raised with. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> so what Ellen White is suggesting is that Martin Luther may not have had all the truths. The, those in the Middle Ages certainly didn't have all the truths. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't have all the truths. But <laughs> Maybe I don't. Maybe yeah, you okay. do. <laughs> okay, Jennifer, I think. Uh, from Ellen G. White from The Great Controversy. In another letter to a priest who had become a disciple of the gospel, Huss spoke with deep humility of his own errors accusing himself, quote, of having felt pleasure in wearing rich apparel and of having wasted hours in frivolous occupations, end quote. Oh, dear. He then added these touching admonitions, quote, may the glory of God and the salvation of souls occupy thy mind and not the possession of benefices, benefices and estates. Mm -hmm. Beware of adorning thy house more than thy soul, <laughs> and above all, give thy care to the spiritual edifice. Be pious and humble with the poor, and consume not thy substance in feasting. Shouldst thou not amend thy life and refrain from super, superfluities? Yeah. I fear that thou wilt be severely chastened, as I am myself. I go ahead and quote it from Bonnet. Quoted from that same guy. Mm -hmm. Consider these questions in the Bible study guide. How would you answer them? Number one, what is progressive light? Why does God reveal truth gradually? How do these principles apply to God's church today? And that has been God's <clears throat> plan. I mean, it, even the children of Israel in Old Testament times, he didn't take them instantly to a full knowledge of the truth from their pagan background, he said, move along slowly. And I mean, I'm sure he understood that if he tried to do too much at one time, they would just yeah. be turned away, like, like she said there. Number two, how do new discoveries of truth relate to previous truths that God's people have understood? Why must new light never contradict old light? Now, you know that this is a 
cardinal doctrine of some churches even in our day. They actually believe that their church leaders have the authority to change something in the Bible because they are more modern and more up-to-date. I mean, that's one of the basic doctrines even of the uh, Islam. You know, that their prophet is more up-to-date than the ones that were before him. So what you're saying is that some of these churches are directly opposing what is statement number two. We must, mm -hmm. uh, new light must never contradict old light. And yeah. we need to be careful ourselves to make sure that doesn't happen in our case. Number three, how did John Huss's letter impact your thinking today? How does it impact your thinking today? What impresses you about this letter from the Bible study guide for Friday? Two of the major themes of this lesson are... From the Bible study guide, the Waldenses, John Whitcliffe, John Huss, and John Huss illustrate what it means to stand on the side of God, witnessing to and proclaiming the Word of God in the darkest times of the cosmic conflict. God's Word is our greatest source of hope and power, enabling us to live and to stand on God's side. Bible study guide. Behind most persecution is at least one of the following. Now, let's, what we're really doing here is trying to understand a little bit of Satan's side in the great controversy. It's, uh, well, we know that it's a good idea to know something about what the enemy is up to, right? The Bible study guide says, typically the causes of early Christian persecution have been classified by church historians according to the following categories. Some were economical. For example, a believer's profession of faith impacted and often restricted his or her transactions with local and regional businesses. The story there in Acts 19, you can remember, is Paul came to Ephesus and he was convincing people to become Christians and give up all their idols and uh, all the, the, the idol makers there, the image makers that said, this guy is destroying our business. So that was an economical basis. And then there's social. For example, Christians refuse to participate in immoral activities. So you, you don't participate with other people who are doing that. Political. Christians were made scapegoats to solve political problems. Um, they were blamed for political problems that had arisen and, and were tortured for it in some cases. And religious, for example, Christian beliefs, practices, and growth were perceived as an existential threat to dominant religions. And they are. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be true. One biblical example of the economic aspects of persecution of Christians is this passage that I mentioned briefly. I guess that's mine. Acts 19, 23 to 27. It was at this time that there was a serious trouble in Ephesus because of the way of the Lord. A certain silversmith named Demetrius made silver models of the temple of Ar the goddess Artemis, and his business brought a great deal of profit to the workers. So he called them all together with others whose work was like theirs and said to them, men, you know that our prosperity comes from this work. Now you can see and hear for yourselves what this fellow Paul is doing. He says the gods made by human hands are not gods at all, and he has succeeded in convincing many people, both here in Ephesus and nearly the whole province of Asia. There is the danger then that this business of ours well, get a bad name. Imagine that. As we know, Satan's, that's from, our, from the Good News Bible. As we know, Satan's kingdom is built on lies and deception. So when people arise under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the truth, it is a direct attack on his kingdom. What happens if you start telling the truth? Any attempt to examine the truth is an existential threat to his life. And thus, anyone who accepts his lies will suppress any attempt at a search for the truth. Some of the movements and forces at work in the Dark Ages and Middle Ages were, giving some examples now, um, I think, Jim, that's yours. Walden says, Franciscans in Scripture. By the beginning of the second millennium after Christ, the Roman Catholic Church... That would be about 1000 A.D. 
the Roman Catholic Church had become a fearsome, centralized, hierarchical behemoth in Europe. It also was the deeply corrupt, a deeply corrupt institution. Church members could not overlook three developments. They felt the need to identify the causes of the church's corruption and to propose solutions. This process resulted in numerous religious and mendicant orders. What's a mendicant order? Uh, guys that walk around begging for money, like, yeah. like friars. They're beggars, basically, yeah. yeah. At the beginning of the 13th century, Francis of Assisi, 18, excuse me, 1181 to 1226, the rather worldly son of a wealthy family had a mystical conversion experience, after which he renounced whatever property he had and declared his intention to in imitate Christ's poverty as much as possible. Francis found they founded the Order of the Franciscans, which had promoted poverty as the virtue. The, Francisca, the Order of the Franciscans, which promoted poverty as a virtue, I don't know, but yeah. the Franciscans were known for their street preaching. In 1209, Francis sought the formal recognition of his order by Pope Innocent III, who was in power from 1198 to 1216. After an initial hesitancy, the Pope granted Francis's request to... Uh, to in, in 1210. In, in 1210. Francis, I might, my lines there. Too. Francis was founded in a woman's order, that of St. Clair, as well as the third order and comprised of lay people. So he, fa he found the three or groups of or three orders that were all approved by the Catholic Church. Just several decades earlier, by the end of the 12th century, Peter Waldo, in 1205, a died. Six, oh. di died in 1205, successful businessman in southern southeastern France, also experienced a conversion, renounced his riches, and preached voluntary poverty. He f also founded an order of, for the poor and appealed to the papacy for approval. Although Pope Alexander III was presiding from 1159 to 1181, initially accepting, accepted Waldo's vow of poverty. His successor, Pope Lucius III, was also who that. presided over the papal see from 1181 to 1185, condemned Waldo and his movement. The Waldo sees as heretical and banned them from the preaching. Worse. Over the next several years, hundred. over several hundred years, the Roman Catholic Church mounted horrific persecutions against the Waldenses that nearly led to their extinction. So, let us consider the similarities before us before these two revivalist movements and religious orders which emerged at, at about the same time in history. The founders of both movements, Francis of Assisi and Peter Waldo, had rather similar conversion experiences. Initially, both men founded their orders on the similar spiritual virals, poverty and street preaching. Both men had similar desires to reform the church and both appealed to the papacy for approval of their order. However, the two, the two orders had radically different relations with the papacy and consequently they had different rates, fates and endings. The Franciscans request for papal approval was initially met with hesitancy, but was later granted. In contrast, Waldo's vow of poverty, which was initially approved by the papacy, was later rescinded. The Franciscans grew into one of the most influential Roman Catholic orders. Today, we can see its influence most notably reflected in the fact that the current pope, although a Jesuit, honored Francis of Assisi by adopting his name. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the Waldenses endured one of the cruelest persecutions in history, persecution directed at their, extermina as, at their extermination. The question by which, the question of why 
is most, imper most pertinent here. What made the difference be between these two movements and orders? The answer is in their ultimate allegiance. The Franciscans, very likely having learned from Waldo's experience, obtained papal approval by giving ultimate allegiance to the Pope. This is, that is, the Franciscan Rec Franciscans recognized the papacy as the ultimate spiritual temporal authority on earth and vowed to support uncontrollably, unconditionally as its authority. its authority in matter of doctrine and practice. The Waldenses, on the other hand, believed that the ultimate authority in, for our lives and teachings sprang out from God's holy scripture. For this reason, they made scripture the heart of their study, preaching and living. Consequently, the Waldenses soon discovered and repudiated an increasing number of Roman Catholic churches, falsehoods, and compromises, such as the veneration of the saints, the most, excuse me, most of the seven Catholic sacraments, the concept of transubstantiation, auricular confession of sins to human priests, the practice of infant baptism, the sale of indulgences, the doctrine of purgatory, and prayer for the dead. Instead, the Waldenses proclaimed that God is the only creator and savior. They proclaimed that God, excuse me, that Christ is the only mediator given of, giver of grace and forgiver of sins. They taught that worship was not restricted to the physical space of Roman Catholic churches, but could be offered to God in any place. The Waldenses did not, in their lifetime, receive the reward for their fullness, faithfulness. But their idea and of, and of their courage to stand for God's word against compromise and the devil's falsehood soon inspired the morning star of the Reformation. Wycliffe and Huss, as well as the rest of the Reformation movement, from the 16th century onward. We need to, we need to cut in here, we're running out of time. But you can see how <coughs> these two are different two things were quite, quite in con contrast. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, it's inspiring and educational to listen to these experiences of reformers. Help us to learn from their experiences and not to make the mistakes that some did um, of compromising. May we study our Bibles, learn the truths that are there for us, and not turn away as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.